Musk, David Bowie, Graham Hancock. Wow, so, I'm in great company there. And so you. here we are, and I'm very excited. So here's the deal. Let's jump right into it because we have a very brief sure. time and, and some very big ideas to express, which sure. are my favorite kinds. There is a saying that you coined that is often identified with you, and yeah. I think it's brilliant, which is that we are a civilization with amnesia. Yeah. And yeah. today I want to talk about a little bit about why we had that amnesia. So let's jump straight to the cover of the book. His new book is Magicians of the Gods, depicting Gobekli Tepe. Yes. What is Gobekli Tepe and what does it signify? Gobekli Tepe is an archaeological site in Turkey, uh, which is rewriting history. It's what's called a megalithic site. In other words, it's a site that's made from huge stones, stone pillars. Uh, and these stone pillars actually take a humanoid form. They're in the uh, shape that we would recognize as the letter T, with the top of the T tilted slightly forward. And that, and that represents the head of the individual, and the pillar represents the body of the individual. And many of the pillars actually have arms carved into their sides with hands with rather spooky long fingers that meet in front of the, the, the belly. So this is a, a megalithic site on a par, in fact, larger than well-known places like Stonehenge, you know, or Karnak in Brittany. But the difference is that Gobekli Tepe is at least 6,000 years older than any other known megalithic site in the world. And this rewrites history because the evolution and development of megalithic architecture in the mainstream view of history, in the story, in the narrative we're told about our past and about the origins of civilization, uh, that was a relatively late development in the human story. We're supposed to have long since stopped being hunter-gatherers, nomadic hunter-gatherers, and we're supposed to have become settled agricultural people creating surpluses that allowed specialists to emerge who had the stonemasonry skills and the astronomical skills, because it's a highly astronomically aligned site, to create a site. The organization of the labor itself is a huge task, to create a site on this scale. And here's the problem. Gobekli Tepe comes out of nowhere. There is no background to it. It, it just suddenly appears in the human record, dated firmly and, and absolutely without question to 11,600 years ago. And it is massive. It's a giant site. Actually, best part of 90% of it is still under the ground. They've identified it with ground penetrating radar. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these huge pillars still, still lying under the ground. And it is as sophisticated or more sophisticated than Stonehenge, but so much vastly older. And it comes at a time when human society is not supposed to have been capable of these kinds of projects. The, the, the mysterious thing about it is that whoever created it, after it had been made and used for about a thousand years, they deliberately buried it. They went to an enormous effort, bringing teams of hundreds of people, effectively with buckets filled with soil and rubble, to pour over the top of these tall pillars, some of which are 20 feet high, to pour over the top of them and completely bury them, though leaving them standing in place, and actually to cover the whole site with a hill, an artificial man-made hill, and that's actually what Gobekli Tepe means in the Turkish language. It means pot-bellied hill, and that's what it was seen as. For 10,000 years after they deliberately buried it, it was untouched and unknown. It was only discovered in the second half of the 1990s, and the excavations are now underway. And in addition, not only do we have the mystery of a supposed group of hunter-gatherers creating the largest megalithic site ever found in the world, and the best, the oldest stuff at Gobekli Tepe is the very best, but also at exactly the moment that Gobekli Tepe is created, we get the sudden spread of agriculture in the same region, a region that had not known agriculture before, where the, the people were hunters and gatherers. Suddenly they know how to do agriculture, and archaeology is stumbling to explain this. How could this happen? And they, they almost put a kind of fairy, fairy tale that, that this must have been some specially inspired group of hunter-gatherers. They can't explain how they woke up one morning equipped with all these skills, with the specialists ready to hand, with the knowledge, and by the way, invent agriculture at the same time. And, uh, but what they're not considering, because it goes against the mainstream view of history, what they're not considering is the possibility that Gobekli Tepe represents a transfer of technology, that we are looking uh, at the handiwork of the survivors of a lost civilization who settled in Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, who were already equipped with the knowledge and the skills to create a megalithic site on this scale, 
and to use it as a center of innovation around which they distributed knowledge of agriculture and taught that knowledge to the local inhabitants. That's what Gobekli Tepe looks like. And the reason that we may speak of a lost civilization is that immediately prior to the emergence of Gobekli Tepe, there was a giant cataclysm on this planet, a cataclysm that unfolded between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And at the end of that cataclysmic period, suddenly out of nowhere, Gobekli Tepe appears. I think the two factors together uh, make it really essential that we reconsider everything we've been taught about the origins of human civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to keep that 11,600 date in your mind because we're going to return to that and to the points you made at the very end about mm -hmm. a global cataclysm. So, so that everyone understands this site, which does have the hideous shelter over the top yes, of it now. Un unfortunately, our archaeologists' aesthetic sense is not very great. And, not and good they, have, at all. they have uglified this site by putting modern structures over the top of it. Um, I, luckily enough, I saw it before a lot of that had been put over the top of it. But, but it's there, and its magic still speaks to us if you just have to set aside the horrible roof they put over parts of it. Understood. Now, the Gobekli Tepe site um, is 50 50 times larger than Stonehenge. Yes, 50 times. The present site, the area that they've excavated so far, is about the size of Stonehenge, but 50 times as much lies under the ground. The excavation has been done by the German Archaeological Institute. Uh, they began work in the second half of the 1990s. It's been a slow process of excavating this site, but they've been over the whole site, they've been over the whole area, far beyond the areas that are now excavated with ground penetrating radar. And they've looked at what's under the ground, and to their astonishment, they've found that so far they've only excavated a tiny fraction of the site, and that much more of it, approximately 50 times as much, still lies beneath the ground. And, and that's why it's right to say that this site is 50 times larger than Stonehenge, because what we see at the moment is just a fraction. There are pillars within the site that we are going to return to as well because there is information encoded in those which we're going to get to yes. at the end of this at the end of the show. I'm going to try to jump through some really big ideas really quickly. There's another site that you talk about extensively in the book and I'd like for us to bring up some pictures of that because it's going to tie into our story as well. Mm -hmm. Gnung Padang. Yes. I realize that this is an artist's rendition of what it would look like. This is in Indonesia. Yes, Tell but me it's, what based, this is. it's based on the very solid science and archaeological work. This is, um, this, this is a site called Gunung Padang in Indonesia. Uh, and as we can see from the artist's impression, it is a, a terraced pyramidal structure. Uh, what the, the, the problem with Gunung Padang is that for a very long time, people believed that it was just a natural hill with a, an old but not extremely old megalithic site on top of it. And that megalithic site that's been in plain view and was in fact first inspected by archaeologists as early as 1914, uh, that megalithic site has long been thought, although not on very good evidence, to be about 2,500 years old. What nobody considered, nobody in the archaeological community considered, was what might be lying below what's on the surface. And we owe our knowledge of that uh, to uh, geologists. This is the, the, the surface view part of the pyramidal structure covered with a relatively recent megalithic site. Uh, but a, a leading geologist in Indonesia, whose name is Dr. Danny Hillman Natuwajaja, uh, who is actually um, in Indonesia's leading expert in megathrust earthquakes. He's, he's a very serious, massively trained, you know, hugely professional geologist. He, he got his PhD at Caltech here, here in the United States. Um, when he visited Gunung Padang, he, ma he made a visit there simply because he wanted to see the megalithic site. And then he started looking at it as a geologist. And he started to suspect that the hill upon which this site was standing was no hill, that this was a pyramid, uh, that it had structural elements to it, and that something very important had been overlooked here. So he brought together a team of, of geological specialists uh, and they brought a, a vast amount of equipment to the site so that they could look inside the structure without actually damaging it. And they used ground penetrating radar for that purpose, but also seismic tomography, electrical resistivity, and other techniques that can be used to give you a sense of exactly what's inside this structure. And what they found to be inside the structure was a, a series of hidden chambers, one of them very large, a large rectangular chamber buried about 100 feet deep 
uh, inside inside this pyramid. Uh, there's in fact three of these chambers and, and absolutely irrefutable evidence that the whole structure from bottom to top is man-made. And what we're looking at on the surface is just the latest structure to be put on that to be put on that site. They then went further and they brought along a couple of tubular drills and they put down the drills into the site and they brought up what are called drill cores right. from the great uh, great depths of the site. And what they brought up were a mixture of worked stone, man-made stone that had been cut by human beings that with clear jointing, putting together the stones, a mixture of that and organic material that was datable. And the datable organic materials put the origin of this site back to 20,000 years ago, back into the depths of the last ice age when Indonesia was a very different place. It was a huge continent-sized landmass, not a series of islands near the Malaysian Peninsula, but a giant now lost continent that was submerged beneath the waves in that cataclysm that occurred between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. And this site stands on the high land that was, never, that was never inundated. So we really badly need to know what is inside those chambers. The, the, the sad uh, sequel to the Gobekli Tepe story is that the, the work on the site has now been stopped for the best part of a year. At Gobekli Tepe? Uh, sorry, at Gunung Padang. Okay. The work at, uh, sorry, did I say Gobekli Tepe? The work at Gunung Padang has been stopped for a year. Um, after uh, initially getting approval from the Indonesian government to begin an excavation, there was a change of leadership in Indonesia. The new president came in and he listened to complaints from archaeologists who didn't like the fact that geologists were doing the work and didn't feel the work should be done, as a matter of fact. They felt that the budget given to the excavation of Gunung Padang should be given instead to their pet projects. And this whole thing has just stopped the excavation in its tracks. And we're hoping very much, I'm in daily contact with, with Danny in Indonesia, we're hoping very much that they will get permission to continue and find out what the hell is inside those chambers, those hidden chambers deep in this mysterious 20,000-year-old man-made pyramid that's sitting there in Indonesia. And it's an interesting thing. The name is Gunung Padang, okay? In the Indonesian language, and many people think that's what the name is in, uh, that means mountain field, which doesn't sound like much. But when you go into the Sundanese language, and this is in the area where the Sundanese language is spoken, you you find that it means mountain of enlightenment and that there is an ancient tradition of wisdom associated with this place and that's why the relatively recent megalithic site is sitting on the top of it it's honoring and respecting overbuilding upon the earlier site which is the source of that name mountain of enlightenment which we see in in, in, in numerous um, sacred sites where they build each era tends to build on top of another, it's, it's so an the deeper you go. Theme. Yeah. It's an almost universal theme, and it can be, it can be confusing for, for archaeology. And there's sure. a, there's a, I feel that we, we're now in the light of this new evidence. We need to reconsider quite a number of megalithic sites around the world and consider whether, whether in fact, we're, we're, we're looking at a, a, a process and whether the dates given to those sites is a, is a falsely young date. This is very much the case, and I go into it in depth in Magicians of the Gods, in the Andes, for example, in Peru, where many megalithic monuments that archaeology has handed over uncritically and without question to the Incas and said that the Incas make them, uh, the evidence is overwhelming on the ground that the Incas did not make them. And they even say so themselves. And they say so themselves, that some former civilization of the gods had made these sites and that they honored and respected them by building around and over them and, and trying to mimic the style, although they never succeeded quite in doing so. So there's, there's this earlier megalithic lair, some of which is just totally stunning, uh, and this is true all over the world, then overbuilt by later cultures, and the mistake is to put the date to the later culture rather than to the earlier culture that founded the site. Understood, and not to bag on archaeologists too much, but listen, you make this point in the book, and uh, Danny, not a Jawawa, I, I, not a I, I, I apologize, I'm not sure I pronounced the name correctly. You make this point that he feels that archaeologists is archaeology is a very imprecise science. Absolutely, D Danny comes at this as a scientist. His his interest is data, which is amusing to me yeah. and probably truthful. Yeah, it's, it is truthful. I, I I don't think that archaeology qualifies as a science. It's not it's not a science. It's it's about the interpretation 
often according to the particular philosophy that the individuals hold, the interpretation of often very scarce and very slim data on the, on, on the ground. And actually, the, the further back you go into the past, the slimmer the data becomes. Uh, and the more speculation is built into the archaeological model. And in this sense, archaeology, I would say, is misleading the public. It's, it's, uh, perhaps it's not deliberate, but it's, a, it's the suggestion that, uh, that they have the facts about the past, when again and again the next turn of the archaeologist's spade changes the model entirely and, and, and comes up with sites that cannot be explained by the existing model of the origins of civilization. And that's what both Gunung Padang in Indonesia and Gobekli Tepe in Turkey are. They're sites that don't fit in to the existing picture. And, and what archaeology needs to do, I think, is to modify their theory of the past in the light of the new facts. That would be good science, but the tendency at the moment, sadly, is to reject the new facts as simply impossible because they don't fit in with the theory. And that's the opposite of good science. That's Absolutely. really bad science. Well, you, you have made mention before of this term, the knowledge filter. And yeah. I've heard you even say that you wondered if it was the same in other in other, other fields of yeah. science. I need to emphasize, by the way, the term is not mine. That's oh. the term of Michael Cremo, uh, who wrote an amazing book called Forbidden Archaeology. Absolutely. And, and, and points out that there's some, some knowledge that's such dynamite for the existing view of things that it literally gets filtered out. It just, it, we never, it never reaches the public. Well, and you make the point that the way that is able to occur is people and their careers and their tenure and all of these things and their finances is, and their ego yes. is tied up in this uh, dogmatic feeling they have towards their beliefs, which leaves them unable to make these changes when things like this pop up, yeah. which leaves it to gentlemen like yourself. Well, it means, it means that, and it's often been the case when there have been re revolutions in ideas, that it takes somebody who's marginal to the field to, to, to bring that information. And I'm or not, outside, because I wouldn't outside use the field. marginal. Yeah, I'm outside, I, I'm, I'm, you know, a, a journalist, actually. Yes. I don't claim to be a, an ar archaeologist. I, I don't claim to be a, a scientist. My, my, my job is to synthesize data across an enormous area. And and, and what that means is that I may be looking at data that archaeologists are not looking at at all. Uh, for the moment, archaeologists are not interested in and apparently completely unaware of the fact that an extinction-level cataclysm took place on this planet between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, right in the foundations of the edifice of history that they have built. But they've built their edifice of history without taking account of this extinction-level event in its foundations. And that surely has to shake everything up. The, the, the possibility that the myths of a former golden age, which are universal, which are worldwide, of a great civilization with almost magical powers, which was destroyed in a global cataclysm involving flood and fire, uh, the possibility that these myths are true now must be taken extremely seriously in the light of the two factors, the evidence, the firm scientific evidence for a massive extinction level global cataclysm between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, and archaeological sites that are coming out of the woodwork that cannot be explained by the existing model of history. This is shaking everything up. And this is the reason I've written this book, as a matter of fact. Let's bring up that photo of the younger Dryas, because this is the time we need to segue into the background and explain what this is. because. A large part of this book is about this period in time yes. of the Younger Dryas, yes. and some of my audience may know what it is, yeah. many may not. Explain briefly what we're talking about, because this it's is a, critical to the understanding it's, of the it's whole a thing. It's a phenomenon that's been known about for many decades. We have very good climate records of the last ice age and of the last 20,000 years. And here's, the, here's how it was, that the peak of the last ice age was about 21,000 years ago. The world was at its coldest, uh, the ice sheets were at their deepest, covering most of the northern half of North America, most of the northern half of northern Europe. And then, slowly, the climate began to warm, and the ice sheets began to thin out a bit. Not a lot. They were still very much intact by 12,800 years ago, but they were less, substantially less than they had been 20,000 years ago. 
And then as, just as the world is going into this nice warming trend, there's a sudden radical change in climate. And, and climate, the, the, the temperature drops massively. And we see that, that spike here, where above the letters YD, as the, 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 the global temperature just plunges to, to as cold as it was at the coldest point of the Ice Age. And this episode lasts for 1,200 years, from 12,800 to 11,600 years ago. And then equally mysteriously, global temper, temperature rockets up. Uh, rockets up again. Uh, I mean, these changes in temperature are, are gigantic. Any modern talk of, of global warming, and let's set aside all the issues around that, any modern talk of global warming is just peanuts. It's just a tiny, tiny little blip by comparison with what happened during the Younger Dryas. And the other thing that we know happened during the Younger Dryas was that there were massive global extinctions of animal species, although the epicenter of these extinctions was in the Americas, particularly in North America. It was a, it was a global problem. So s clearly something very, very bad happened. And this, this attracted the attention of, of a group of very major mainstream scientists, uh, earth scientists, geologists mainly, who were trying to get to the bottom of this. Why did this sudden climate shift happen? What caused it to happen? Uh, and they began to investigate. They began to look at the earth. They began to look at the stratum of soil that goes back to that period. And what they found in that stratum from 12,800 years ago was a thick layer of soot which is evidence of continent-wide wildfires. And embedded in and just below the soot, they found a number of very specific things. They found nano-diamonds, tiny, tiny diamonds that are only visible under a microscope. They found melt glass, which is basically trinitite, the stuff that, that you know, we, we, we saw after the first nuclear, nuclear explosions on, on Earth, evidence of enormous heat, um, carbon spherules, a, a layer of iridium in, in the soil. All of these we know already from previous research, research, for example, done on the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, we know already that these are the sure and certain signs of a cosmic impact. Nothing else can cause them. Nothing else can cause temperatures in excess of the boiling point of quartz across 50 million square miles of the Earth's surface. And that's what we're finding uh, in the Younger Dryas boundary, this layer of soil which marks the end of one period and the beginning of another and it was a cataclysmic end and so they realized that there had been a cosmic impact. It hadn't been noticed before. Nobody had found any crater. Normally craters are what we look for uh, if we're dealing with a cosmic, and nobody had found one. But now we know why initially craters were not found. This is the area uh, where the evidence for the Younger Dryas impact has, has come from. See, comets, the, uh, the, I have to cut to the chase. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're dealing with a comet here. We're dealing with a giant comet. The evidence is now in. This is a comet that would have been in the range of 100 to 200 kilometers in diameter, which entered the inner solar system from deep space about 20,000 years ago. It was captured by the sun and went into an orbit that crosses the orbit of the Earth. As comets often do, it began to break up into multiple fragments, some of them very large, some of them quite small. Some, some of them a kilometer in diameter, some of them a meter in diameter, some of them just dust and debris, some of them huge rocks. And what happened was at least four of those rocks as the Earth was crossing the path of the comet. The debris, as the comet begins to break out, spreads up right along the orbit of the comet. And as the Earth was passing through the orbit of the comet, at least four of those large chunks in the range of one to two kilometers of, in diameter entered the Earth's atmosphere and smacked into what was then the North American ice cap. 12,800 years ago, it was still a couple of kilometers deep. And, and so the craters were excavated in ice and they were transient as the ice melted away in the enormous shock and heat created by these impacts. As the ice melted away, the craters vanished. That's not the complete story, though, because in, within the last year, the evidence for craters has begun to be found. Right at the edge of the North American ice cap, there are a number of craters, the Cor Corosol Crater, the Bloody Creek structure, and so on, that are now firmly associated with this event. And there is evidence of shock effects on the ground under the ice cap. So the impacts were huge enough to shock the ground beneath that two kilometer deep ice. Uh, and, and, and now the case has gone from being an argument amongst scientists to being just about as close to absolutely defined fact as it's possible to get in science. We were hit by fragments of a giant comet 12,800 years ago, and it changed everything. And this, I believe, was 
was the cataclysm which lost us a whole civilization and knocked us on the head as a species and made us uh, a species with amnesia. And the story's not over, because 12,800 years ago, the Earth goes into this hell regime of the Younger Dryas, dreadfully freezing cold, animal extinctions everywhere. Last 1,200 years, and then we shoot out into warmer climates. That's also further fragments of the same comet. Again, the Earth crosses their path. They plow into the atmosphere. This time, they hit ocean. And, and the, effect, uh, the effect is to throw an enormous amount of water vapor up into the upper atmosphere uh, and create a greenhouse effect, which causes the very rapid warming that occurred at that time and was, of course, accompanied by enormous tidal waves and, and global floods 11,600 years ago. That is the date for the foundation of Gobekli Tepe, and that is the date that Plato gave us long ago for the destruction of the lost civilization of Atlantis. Now, Kaching. <laughs> Kaching. archaeologists have been in the habit of laughing at the Atlantis story and dismissing it and coming up with all kinds of fantasies that Plato made it up for some sort of political purpose. He invented it. But Plato said very clearly that this was a, a disaster uh, which originated in events in the sky uh, and that it resulted in a massive flood which submerged, destroyed and submerged a huge island on which the continent of the, 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 the civilization of Atlantis existed existed. And that this happened, he says it clearly in black and white, that it happened 9,000 years before the time of Solon. And Solon was Plato's own ancestor who had visited Egypt in 600 BC and there had learnt the story of Atlantis. And 9,600 BC is 11,600 years ago, which is the date of that second spike which was accompanied by global flooding uh, and where suddenly and mysteriously we see the evidence for a transfer of technology at places like Gobekli Tepe, the survivors of the lost civilization coming there and attempting to restart their civilization. I don't think they succeeded, but you can see the, the fingerprints, you can see that effort was made the, the, and the agriculture stayed with us. We learned agriculture from these people and it passed on from then. And that was the beginning of the story. That's the beginning of the story of civilization is actually a re-beginning. It's a starting again after a global cataclysm. One thing that I want to use to demonstrate the sheer kinetic force that we're talking about here, bring up the picture of Dry Falls just before we move on to who the actual magicians of the gods are in our remaining segment. Bring up, the, okay, this is the part that just blows my mm. mind because this is violence on a planetary scale mm. that is incomprehensible and the sheer pounds per square inch mm. of just voluminous water is it blows my mind. Explain what this is okay, and what well, it this means. Is, this is Dry Falls. It's in Washington State. It's a fossilized waterfall, as a matter of fact. Um, it, it's it, it, between Upper and Lower Grand Coulee, which is a huge gash in the ground, 40, 50 miles long, that was actually cut by flooding. And this fossilized waterfall is a remnant of that flooding. It's, it's multiple times larger than Niagara Falls. This is a fossilized waterfall. But I, the reason I wanted to ask you about it is because it is a great... Example. Well, the point, first of all, the point to be clear is Niagara Falls is the re result of 12,000 years of work of a river, and this falls was created in about two weeks, as the indications show. And the reason is that the flooding that came over this falls and that carved this falls out and then went away and stopped and receded and left the falls in the form we see it now, this is not just a flood of water. This is a flood that is jostling with gigantic icebergs the size of oil tankers that has ripped up whole forests by their roots that is filled with rubble and mud. It's a highly erosive agent that is pouring over the land, and that's why we have the channeled scablands, and that's why we have a feature like Upper and Lower Grand Coulee, and that's why we have this fossilized testament to an unbelievable cataclysm that descended upon North America 12,800 years ago and wiped out the megafauna, wiped out the mammoths, wiped out the woolly rhinos, and I believe lost us a whole civilization from the archaeological record. I understand. This is this, I think, is encoded in our cellular memory because most, most cultures have a flood myth. We have this almost inherent fear of comets. Mm -hmm. And that's where I want to transition into who the people of the title are. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that was really curious to me as I read the book, you, if we can bring up the picture of Quetzalcoatl, is when, when you talk about these people that are the magicians of the gods, yeah. Let's back up just a little bit, you guys. Okay, that, that'll work for right now. 
Um, you can see that he's holding in his hand a, yes. a curious kind of bag. Yes. This is from one of the oldest archaeological strata of Mexico. It's from a site called La Venta on the Gulf of Mexico, attributed to a very mysterious people called the Olmecs, who were the predecessors of the, of the, of the Maya. And it's the oldest representation to survive in Mexico uh, of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. As you can see, the serpent that wraps around this, this block has a plume on top of its head. Then seated in the middle of the serpent is this guy in a very peculiar posture and he's holding a bag in his hand, some, mm -hmm. kind, of, some, some kind of bag. Now Quetzalcoatl in the Mexican tradition, in the ancient traditions of Mexico, uh, was a bringer of civilization. He was a, a civilizing hero who came into a, a situation that was very bad. People were very demoralized. They were living in rudimentary conditions, very primitive conditions, and he taught them the gift gifts of civilization. That's what he's remembered of. And he taught peace and he, and, and, and he taught spirituality. And, 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 and then he left. He was gone. He was driven out of the area, as we're told in the myths. Now, so he's a civilizer. Now, the curious thing is that exactly the same iconography, the same bag, appears on one of the pillars at Gobekli Tepe. Can we bring up uh, pillar 43, please? And there, and there is pillar 43, uh, which, which, and at the top of it, in a row, are those are three of those bags, the same curved handle, the same, yes. the same shape of bag. And there we know that it's close to 12,000 years old, whereas the one in Mexico is only supposed to be about three and a half thousand years old. So we have the same iconography in both parts of the world, and that iconography spreads further. You can find it in ancient Mesopotamia, in Sumer, for example, where the civilizing hero was called Oannes, who was said to have emerged. From from the waters of the ocean and to have taught the gifts of civilization to the demoralized local inhabitants and there he is and again he is holding one of these bags in his hand and this universal iconography the fact that we find the same symbolism in cultures that are not supposed to have been connected at all that existed at different periods of history and had no interaction with one another widely separated parts of the globe can only be explained one way, that we have a remote common origin for this source, that it goes, that for, the, for this imagery, that it goes right back, right back to the time of Gobekli Tepe, right back to the time of that global cataclysm before 11,600 years ago. I think that th this is why I call the book Magicians of the Gods, because these figures in Mesopotamia uh, were called that. They were the magicians of the gods. They were the seven sages. They were referred to as the seven sages. They carried these bags. Uh, they taught the gifts of civilization and they were attributed with almost supernatural power. They were magicians, they were sorcerers. They could do what ordinary human beings uh, could not do. And the same story is told in Mexico, the same story is told in South America, the same story is told in India, and the iconography is the same in every case. So I, I think we're looking at the hints and the memories of a lost civilization here. So Graham, the question is then, what's in the bag of tricks? I. I can't answer that question. We don't know. More, more work needs to be no, more work needs to be done. I, I, I sometimes jokingly say it was their stash. You That's, know? That, that who, crossed my mind as well. We got a bunch of weed in here. <laughs> who knows? Because, because a, 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 ancient cultures honored and venerated the psychedelic plants right. in, a, in a way that we do not, and saw them as um, allies in the search for knowledge. They were, they were regarded as a, an essential experience to have in the process of becoming an adult. Uh, and whereas our society completely demonizes these, these substances and, and, and regards them as utterly, utterly worthless. So uh, this is something else we should take account of, that, mm -hmm. that uh, ancient civilizations were very different from our own. And that's something that I'd love for you to come back in the future, because I want to talk about psychedelics with you at length Bear with me just a second. When I look at these purses, and I keep, th I, this is haunting me since I picked up your book. And just today I was thinking, because you've mentioned, uh, you know, perhaps it, 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 was a symbol like a Masonic handshake or yes. something, so that we know some, each other. Some secret, some secret symbol which was meaningful to the members of the Brotherhood, if you like. That's my that's my suggestion of what of what is going on here. That it, that it's symbolism and and it is intended to uh, bring about a recognition factor. Today I'm driving and I'm thinking and I'm still thinking about these purses, and I was like, I wonder if the purses could be just a symbol of the knowledge carriers. Perhaps. Perhaps, and there there are traditions which suggest that because okay. that's that's what that's the ultimate that's what they characteristic are. of these individuals is wisdom and knowledge. Yeah, it, it's amazing, and 
clearly Oanis has that bag, and it, it's amazing that it that it transcends time and culture. It's interesting like that. in the diagram you're showing. They're, they're 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 often referred to as fish garbed figures. Yes. Their ability to survive the flood, to emerge from the waters of the flood, uh -huh. uh, was symbolized as as that they had the characteristics of a fish. And and but it in if you go into the accounts, you can see that in some of the accounts from ancient Sumer, they say, but they were not fish. They were wearing clothing that resembled the scales and the head of a fish. So it's a kind of uniform or, or a costume that they, that they are wearing that is associated with them. So here we are in the 21st century thinking that we are just at our top, top of our game and we're warlike and we waste our money and our time on iPhones and mm -hmm. Kardashians and things of that nature. It makes me wonder who this lost civilization was and because when we think about the sheer violence of the impact and the after effects that you describe, mm. not just happening once, but happening twice, the mm. second one mm. goes into the ocean, and then in 1908 or 1911, mm. we have well, Tungusta. The, the, most, the most recent documented impact from the torrid meteor stream, yes. because the torrid meteor stream, which the Earth still passes through twice a year, is the debris stream of that enormous comet that caused all the damage between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. It's still in orbit. Bits of it are still in orbit, and we still we still pass through it. And, and as recently as 1908, there was uh, a, an encounter with a bit of debris from that stream, 30th of June, 1908, over, a, fortunately, an uninhabited area of Siberia, just a little bit came down, about 100 meters in, in diameter. It didn't even reach the ground. It, it was an airburst. It exploded in the air about five kilometers above the ground. But the and it effect, was still devastating. The effect on the ground was utterly devastating. Uh, across an area of 2,000 square kilometers, which is roughly the size of the city of London, 80 million trees were flattened in an instant. And if that had happened over a major center of urban population, rather than over an uninhabited area of Siberia, uh, we would be much more focused on these issues than we are at the moment. That The debris stream of that comet has intervened in human history several times, and it has changed our story. Uh, and we are still interacting with the remnants of that comet. I have met only a handful of people in my life that I felt like in 100 years, they're going to be on the right side of history, and you were one of them. I, Everything that you're saying makes sense to me. I've long in my own life had a yearning and a, a feeling that, listen, I don't, I don't have the whole story here. This just doesn't, it doesn't add up in a logical way. So what you're laying out, and then uh, the scientists, the, the, the 30 team, 30 member team mm. that have worked on the higher dryas, uh, younger dryas. Younger dryas cataclysm. This is solid science. Uh, and one of the things I've done in this book, because it has, has been confined to the rarefied atmosphere of leading professional journals, I, I, I've taken that data and, and tried to put it into a form that is much more accessible to the general reader in the book. And this, this probably is the first time that this information is really getting across to the general public in a, in a, in a major way. And so first time that its implications have been considered for the story of the origins of our civilization. I'd like to say just one more thing. Certainly. Which is that uh, Plato's story of Atlantis has a lesson for us, I think. Uh, the story of Atlantis uh, is that Atlantis was once this great and wise civilization, very generous and, and kind and, and supportive, uh, deeply spiritual. But as time went by, it became puffed up with arrogance and pride. It became cruel. It started to project its power around the world uh, and, and, and to shape the destinies of other, of other peoples uh, in a very negative way and, and um, became so confident of its own power that it was utterly unprepared for the cataclysm when it came. And I can't help feeling that we tick all the boxes of the next lost civilization because that's the kind of civilization we are today. We are arrogant, oversure of ourselves, projecting our power around the world, totally focused on material things, ignoring the realm of spirit in time. Living only in the moment. Living only in the moment with short-term economic gains being our entire focus. Uh, and, and this is not the right way to live. This is ph philosophically and spiritually wrong that we're living in this way. And, and the lesson of history is we need to learn humility. We need to learn to bear our prosperity with moderation. And that's what Plato said about Atlantis, that they failed to 
bear their prosperity with moderation and that this cost them very dear. We're probably the first civilization in the whole story of human history who have the capacity to intervene in our cosmic environment. We actually could make our cosmic environment safe. It's not a gloom and doom story. We can make it safe. We need not become the next lost civilization. But while our eye is on all the hatred and fear and suspicion that are generated in the world today, while we are spending trillions of dollars on sophisticated weapons of destruction to wipe, and wipe one another out and, and murder one another in, in horrific manners, we are not attending to the real threat to the future of humanity. And if we were to make this a grand human project collectively to get together to make the cosmic environment of Earth safe, we could absolutely do it. The choice is in our hands. Ladies and gentlemen, we make tomorrow. And Graham Hancock, thank you so much for being on, our, on the show. I'm, I've been very excited about this. I am enjoying the book. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Magicians of the Gods. It is a great book. I'm in the midst of it right now. I've been following the work of Graham for a long, long time. And thank you so much. Thank you. you I know you've been very busy over the last